Bolivian President Luis Arce has signed a contract with the Russian Direct Investment Fund for the supply of the Sputnik V vaccine to fight COVID-19. Clinical trials of two of Cuba's COVID-19 vaccine candidates named Abdullah and Mambisa are advancing with both proving to be safe. Explosions rocked Yemen's Aden airport on Wednesday, killing at least 26 people shortly after the arrival of a plane carrying a new Saudi-backed unity government. From the headquarters of Telisa English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south and I'm Katrina Goss. Bolivian President Luis Arce has signed a contract with the Russian Direct Investment Fund for the supply of the Sputnik V vaccine to fight COVID-19. President Arce, who thanked the Russian authorities for their support to combat the spread of the novel coronavirus in the country, informed that after negotiations and the evaluation of several proposed vaccines, it was decided to secure doses of the Russian vaccine to immunise the population. The first official shipment of the vaccine is due to arrive at the end of March with 1.7 million doses, while another similar shipment should arrive at the end of April and a third in May. This is a very serious issue that forces us to be absolutely responsible with the Bolivian people, not only on the technical side of evaluating all the alternative and making the best decision for our country in terms of vaccines, but also we do not want to make any mistakes in negotiating with intermediaries. We went directly to the main sources, to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer made contact with its official distributor. And with the help of the Russian embassy here in Bolivia, we managed to contact them. We managed to carry out the negotiations that have happily ended in good terms for all Bolivians. Various sectors in Peru are questioning the terms of the new agricultural reform law passed by less than half of the country's lawmakers on Tuesday. After Parliament approved the law, farm workers blocked the North Pan American Highway to express their rejection of the legislation. The demonstrators who blocked the highway with trucks announced that several parliamentarians had offered money to sector workers to support the law. Small producers warned that the legislation will lead to further unemployment, lower wages and the bankruptcy of agricultural enterprises. In Brazil, a sudden storm caused the death of at least five people and a disappearance of another two in the state of Sao Paulo. On Tuesday night, heavy rains caused landslides and flooding in the city of Embu das Ardis on the outskirts of Greater Sao Paulo. According to local firefighters, a mother and her two children died after being buried by a mudslide, while two other members of the same family remain missing. A fifth victim was dragged away in the mud. Pro-choice activists celebrated on the streets of Buenos Aires this Wednesday after the bill legalising abortion was approved by the Senate, marking a victory for the women's movement that has been fighting for the right for decades. And the Uruguayan government has agreed a hike in utility rates in the midst of the economic and social crisis in the country. We have more details in the following report. Year, the Uruguayan government announced that there will be a general rise in utility rates as of January the 1st. With this decision, the government is implementing a second increase since it took office on March the 1st, 2020. The first details regarding the hike came on Tuesday, when the new president of the Antel state-owned telecommunications company announced that the new prices for data, fixed and cellular telephone services. For mobile telephony there will be an increase of 6.36%, while data services will rise by 9.5%. And in the case of fixed telephony, we are actually cutting the fixed fee by 5.24%. These are the figures, and as I explained, they reflect the structure of all our expenses. The announcement was followed by a statement from the executive branch with the following adjustments. Fuel prices will increase by 6.19%, super gas by 6.9%, and the price of diesel will remain unchanged. Electricity rates will increase by an average of 5% and the increase in water rates will be 6.5%. Directors of the public companies that support the opposition have described the moves as negative.
I understand that the substantial figures that UTE has been accumulating allow it to make different decisions in order to adapt the citizen economic situation. So, in principle, the assessment cannot be anything other than negative. This is also a negative adjustment measure for workers, as it is the confirmation that, just as there was in 2020, there will also be a reduction in real wages in 2021. But it is also a second increase by a government that expressly said during the election campaign that it would lower public utility rates. The campaign was based on lies, but they tried to make out that there were huge rate adjustments every January 1st, which is far from reality. What happens in the companies is that they have to adjust rates according to inflation to cover costs. This lie, which has been repeated a thousand times today, is against their interest. The truth is that this second public utility rates hike in the last 10 months takes place amid the complex economic and social situation in which more and more people are facing difficulty in paying their bills. The increases will be effective as of January the 1st. During a visit to the Centre for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, Cuban President Miguel Diaz Canel confirmed the positive results of the ongoing clinical trials of two of the country's COVID-19 vaccine candidates named Abdullah and Mambisa. According to the Director General of the prestigious scientific institution, the results that have been obtained so far with the two candidates reflect the safety of both. The two candidates are based on different administration methods, one an intramuscular shot and the other a nasal applied vaccine. Currently in the clinical development phase, Abdullah has been administered to 132 healthy volunteers and Mambisa to 88. Only mild side effects have been recorded to date. This Wednesday, Cuba's National Director of Epidemiology, Dr. Francisco Duran, offered a report on the COVID-19 situation in the country. As of last night, 3,272 patients had been admitted of whom 712 were suspected cases. We are talking about people with symptoms and some epidemiological elements. 1,031 people are under surveillance and 1,529 are confirmed active cases. As you can see, a high figure, very high, which means the epidemiological situation is even more tense because we had achieved low figures previously, but this is a high number of active cases. And Dr. Duran reported 86 new positive COVID-19 cases confirmed during the past 24 hours. With these samples processed yesterday, and with the 86 people who were diagnosed with the disease yesterday, the country now accumulates a total of 1,462,068 samples tested. And of these, 11,687 people have been confirmed with the virus, about 0.8%. If Lillian allows us to see the graph where testing is outlined by province, as we have also shown, Havana is the city with the highest percentage of analyzed samples, followed by Santiago de Cuba province. Finally, the Cuban Director of Epidemiology offered his opinion regarding the measures that the government will implement from January 2021 to fight the spread of the coronavirus. Starting on January the 1st, the number of flights from a group of countries will decrease. We already mentioned them, and these are the countries that represent the highest number of confirmed cases, and this corresponds to the epidemiological situation of these countries. This has been reported. The United States, Mexico, Bahamas, a group of countries. Secondly, starting on January the 10th, every person that arrives in our country must have obtained a PCR test to diagnose COVID-19 in the last 72 hours before traveling. Authorities in the United States have confirmed the first case of the new strain of the coronavirus detected in the United Kingdom. The positive COVID-19 case was reported by health authorities in the state of Colorado. The patient is a 20-year-old man who is currently isolated and has no history of traveling. Authorities say they are working to detect any further potential cases of this strain and contain its spread. According to experts, this variation of the novel coronavirus is 70% more contagious. And also in the United States, New Yorkers are preparing to welcome in the new year virtually, given the increase in COVID-19 cases in the country.
New York City authorities announced that Times Square will not be open to the public as is tradition this New Year's Eve. Instead, the annual party and live performances will be enjoyed virtually, with those wishing to attend streaming the event online or watching it on television. On Tuesday, a test run for the confetti that will rain down over Times Square was conducted. The confetti, which weighs almost a tonne, is made up of messages written in recognition of the efforts of key workers on the front lines of the fight against COVID-19. Many U.S. cities are changing the way they ring in the new year as COVID-19 cases and deaths surge nationwide. A landslide smashed into a residential area near the Norwegian capital on Wednesday, injuring 10 people and destroying several homes. Some 200 people have been evacuated amid fears of further landslides, while more than 20 people are missing. We are assessing what has happened, and we will brief it by the disaster response team. First and foremost, my thoughts are with those directly affected by this. There are many that have not been accounted for. This is a huge disaster. Explosions rocked Yemen's Aden airport on Wednesday, killing at least 26 people shortly after the arrival of a plane carrying a new Saudi-backed unity government. At least two explosions were heard as cabinet members were leaving the aircraft. The information minister reported that all the members of the government were safe, but more than 60 people were said to have been injured in the blasts. Another explosion hit close to the city's heavily fortified presidential palace, where cabinet members were taken following the incident at the airport. There were no immediate reports of injuries or fatalities from the second blast site. The cabinet members arrived in Aden days after being sworn in in Saudi Arabia. Yemen's internationally recognized Saudi-backed government and southern separatists formed a power-sharing cabinet on December 18th, forging a joint front against the Houthi movement, which has seized the capital, Sana'a, and much of the north of the country. And the Prime Minister of Yemen's Saudi-backed government condemned the attack on Aden Airport, in which at least 26 people were killed, just moments after the new unity government flew in. This was a cowardly terrorist attack. It puts the government in front of its responsibilities, which is the mission for ending the coup and regaining the government's control and spreading stability in our country. The government is in Aden to stay and to exercise its duties and operations. With the strong will of our people, the acts of terror will not stop us from doing our work. Indian farm workers and the government began the sixth round of negotiations this Wednesday in an attempt to reach an agreement on three new agricultural sector laws. The meeting is being held in the capital, New Delhi. Representing the government in the negotiations, Trade and Industry Minister Som Parkash stated that this Wednesday's dialogue could be final after the failure of the five previous meetings. For a month, 40 agricultural unions have been protesting in rejection of the three new laws for the agricultural sector. Workers stress that the new regulations attack food sovereignty, favour the private sector and threaten their livelihoods. China emphasized that its handling of a case involving 12 Hong Kongers who tried to illegally cross the border to Taiwan was in accordance with rule of law and rejected foreign interference in the case after their sentence was announced on Wednesday morning. China is a country under the rule of law, where laws must be followed and violations must be punished. China's judicial organs handled the case in strict accordance of the law. China firmly opposes the interference in Chinese internal affairs and judiciary sovereignty from any country or organization using any excuses. We urge the European side to abide by international laws and the basic principles for international relations and stop interfering with Chinese judiciary sovereignty and internal affairs in any form. A spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry stressed that the United States must get China's approval before any real estate transaction involving the U.S. Embassy and consulates in China, including the Consulate General in Hong Kong. The $332 million U.S. sale of property owned by its consulate in Hong Kong has not been approved by Chinese authorities. In view of the United States' size regulation on the real estate management of foreign embassies and consulates in the United States, and based on the principle of reciprocity, China requires the U.S. Embassy and consulates in China, including the Consulate General in Hong Kong, to submit a written application in advance and provide detailed information accordingly before the lease, purchase, sale, or in any other way acquire or dispose of real estate properties, and before carrying out new constructions, reconstructions, expansions, and renovations of the premises.
Only after getting the Chinese side's approval in written form can their relevant procedures be handled. Pictures of slain Iranian Revolutionary Guards Commander Qasim Soleimani were displayed in the streets of the Lebanese capital, Beirut's southern suburb, this Wednesday, ahead of the first anniversary of his assassination. Soleimani was killed in Baghdad along with Iraqi Commander Abu Mahdi al muhandis in a U.S. drone strike on January 3rd this year. The Iraqi parliament on Saturday organized a ceremony to honor the top Iranian and Iraqi commanders, during which lawmakers ratified their commitment to a resolution calling to expel all foreign troops from the country. On Tuesday, tributes were also paid to Soleimani in Palestine, as the commander is remembered for playing a major role in strengthening Palestinian resistance movements against the Israeli regime. Qasem Soleimani was one of the great men who preserved the Palestinian cause and preserved the path of the martyrs. A great leader, his blood would not be wasted. He was a man who conquered the Zionist and the IS group aggressions. He was a hero of the resistance. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. You can also follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.